Baptist Church. I'll start with highlighting some of the stuff that has been put in place for safe worship as according to the government guidelines. You'll have noticed our ushers and stewards who are all here to help us keep safe. Please stay in the seat you have been allocated. Please keep to the social distancing rules and use the hand sanitizers as necessary. If you have brought an offering, there will be a receptacle in the foyer for you to put it in as you leave at the end of the service. And also, at the end of the service, please stay in your seats until you are directed to leave. Leave promptly is not like we don't want to have you here, but please meet outside if you want to talk to each other. Thank you to all our facilitators for today, our welcome team, our stewards, and Anna, our pianist. Thank you very much. So again, welcome to Edmonton Baptist Church. For all of you who are watching us live this morning, we welcome you. We also welcome those of you who will be joining us later when you watch the recording. And if you are visiting with us today, a very special welcome. As you know, we are not allowed to sing for the time being, so our services have been very different from what we are accustomed to. But we are here. God is with us. Let us pray. Spirit of God, unseen as the wind, gentle as is the dove, Teach us to love and teach us to sing. Joy to you, Lord, above. Love in our hearts, praise in our prayers. We follow on your way. Lord of the sky, Lord of the earth, answer us when we pray. Amen. Psalm 121 is our call to worship, and we are all going to read quietly. Let us read. I look to the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help will come from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you fall. Your protector is always with Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for safe travel to your house. Father, I pray your blessing on each person gathered here and for everyone joining in the worship at home. You tell us in your word that where two or three are gathered together, you are in the midst. So we thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you for keeping us and protecting us throughout this week. 
I pray for the ongoing work of Edmonton Baptist Church. I commit our leaders to you, the ministers, deacons, office staff, and all who work for the glory of God in this part of the kingdom. I pray for other Christian fellowships also gathering today. Bless them, Lord, and pour out your spirit. Bless their leaders as they wait on you. O Lord, O God, I pray for the borough of Enfield and for the local communities in which you have placed us. Lord, that our streets be safe, that our communities be good places to live, work, and raise families. Thank you, Lord, for all who work to help our borough run smoothly. Street cleaners, council workers, doctors, nurses, postal workers, carers, and for the many others. I pray for their continued good health and willingness to serve. And so, Lord, we pray for the world, a very different place from six months ago. As we face the coronavirus, help us to work and to walk as brothers and sisters and not as rivals. I pray for compassion and support, especially for those who need it most, refugees and other disadvantaged groups. Prayers too for areas where there is conflict and tension, Hong Kong, China, Palestine, Israel, and the United States, to mention a few. Lord, I pray against injustice in all its forms. Father God, give our leaders knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Guide them in the way they should go. Let men and women of God in every government raise their voices in prayer. I offer prayers too, Lord, for our own Prime Minister and his cabinet, the opposition, and all who bear the responsibility of authority. Our God and Father, you see and know the joys of our hearts. Thank you for the testimonies, the ones we have heard and the ones deep in our hearts. Lord, we praise you and give you glory. I pray also for the known and unknown among us who are sick, lonely, or in despair. Father, raise them up, gather them unto yourself, and give them peace. Father, I ask that you comfort those who have lost loved ones. In our fellowship, we remember Vivienne, Sheila, Hamilton, Victoria, Joycelyn, Carla, and the Sterling family. Lord, there are others. Be merciful to them. Finally, Lord, I pray for families and marriages. In spite of these troubled times, I ask that families rediscover the joys of being together, that parents and children learn more about you and each other, that husbands and wives will fall in love again and their marriages enriched as they seek you together, for teenagers and young adults facing uncertain futures, and Lord, for the unhappy families facing financial hardship, domestic and emotional abuse. I pray, Father, for your intervention. Give them a mighty testimony. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being with us and for hearing our prayers. We give you honor and praise in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning all. Our reading this morning is taken from Galatians chapter 6, reading from verses 7 to verse 9. 
Do not deceive yourselves. No one makes a fool of God. People will reap exactly what they sow. If they sow it in a field of their, nat of their natural desires, from it they will gather the harvest of debt. If they sow in the field of the Spirit, from the Spirit they will gather the harvest of eternal life. So let us not become tired of doing good, for if we do not give up, the time will come when we will reap the harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Olvin. And for a blessing through poetry, we turn to our brother Samuel. Thank you, Samuel. Good morning, church. Hope we're all well. So it's just a short poem. It's called How Great Thou Art. If God can only be loved when I am rich and fat with favor, if he can only be trusted when my fridge is full and my house is warm, when my account is loaded and I can buy many, many things. If God can only be enjoyed when I am employed, when my mind is well and my body is strong, when I am happy and handsome and rich, financially free, beautiful and adored, respected and rewarded, for all my efforts by peers and professionals, if God can only be enjoyed when he's given me something else, either he is not great or my faith is too small. God bless. Thank you, Samuel. We've been reminded God is the God of the mountains, and God is also the God of the valleys. Pastor Isaac, our youth pastor, is bringing us God's message for today. But before he comes to us, let us quieten our hearts as we watch this video. Thank you. Seek you to bring all 
silence surrounds us, then comfort a spirit of truth. For you never will leave us, never forsake us. You promise that you'll see us through. God opens our hearts to hear his words today. Pastor Isaac. Good morning, church. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah, I don't. The mic isn't on. But the acting has a slide thing. Turn off with it. One, two, three. But you can hear me better here, isn't it? Yeah. This one. Yeah. Cool. I'll use this one for now. That's fine. Um, no, I'll use this one. I'll use this one. It's okay. Okay. How's everyone doing? Yeah. You're good, yeah? I wanted to use the handheld because I like to move around, as you all know. But because we're streaming, if I went all the way over there, those at home couldn't see me anyway. So good morning to you who are here and good morning to all those who are streaming. Um, it is um, good to be here. It's good to be alive. Um, it was good to see you all. Let me start with a word of prayer. Yeah, let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for today. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you for who you are. For Lord, those seasons may change. You never change. And we can trust in the consistency and faithfulness of your character. So Lord, I commit um, us into your hands this day. Um, I pray, Lord, that the words I speak, Lord, will be from you. And I pray that we will not only be listeners, Lord, but that we will be doers and that we will put the word into practice for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. And you know, yeah, because um, we know we're slowly coming back to church. You know, the government is allowing us to meet, but we can't sing. And I was thinking, that's the one thing I really wanted to do is sing. Um, not that I can sing, <laughs> but what you find is when you sing as part of the congregation, you get to hide your bad voice. <laughs> so then we can all sing together. And it sounds joyous when we sing together. But I trust that in, in due time, at the right time, we'll all be able to sing together again um, at the right time. And speaking of timing, that brings us to today's message. Now, today's passage is from Galatians. Um, the book of Galatians, and um, I'll be focusing on chapter 6, verse 9, which says, Do not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. And I read that verse and I think, yes, this is fantastic. This guarantees a harvest if I don't give up. But I guess the part that I struggle with and the part that some of you might struggle with is, when is the proper time? Is it six months? Is it one year? Is it two years? I guess that's the difficult part, isn't it? Sometimes we don't always know when the proper time is, when that will be. I remember um, not too long ago when we were all on lockdown, and it was like, when are they going to release us? When am I going to be able to <laughs> see people again and be free? Um, and then it was, you know, slowly and in increments. So I think sometimes the difficulty is not necessarily in waiting, but not knowing how long we'll have to wait for. But the Bible does tell us that if we do not give up, if we don't grow weary, it guarantees that at the proper time, we will reap a harvest. And that brings me to a story in the book of Judges. Now, in the book of Judges, the theme of the book of Judges is that it was a time when everyone in Israel just did what they thought was right to them. Everyone lived, spoke their own truth and lived their own truth. And so there is a story in the book of Judges, chapter 19 and chapter 20, which I want to share with you today. Now, the interesting thing about um, this story is, in verse 1, it says at the time when Israel had no king. And that is really interesting because monarchy wasn't established in Israel until the book of Judges. 
uh, sorry, onto the book of Samuel, sorry. And so the events of Judges happen before the events of um, 1 Samuel, when Israel say to Samuel, we want to be like the rest of the world. We want to be like everyone else, so give us a king. And God says to um, Samuel, the people are not rejecting you, they're rejecting me by asking for a king, because God was their king. So when the chapter starts with, it was a time when Israel had no king, I think what the verse is really telling us is it was the time when Israel didn't care about the kingship of God. Where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so it tells us in there that there was a man whose wife ran away. Now, she didn't run away to a lover, but she ran away back to her father. She became angry and ran away back to her father. So he takes a four-day journey and goes to retrieve her. So when he goes to the father's house, they take him in, and I guess everything is, you know, reconciled, and he's about to take her back. But after three days, when he's ready to leave, the father says, oh, it's, it's getting late. Stay the night and go tomorrow. And so he delays a few more days, but then he's, they set out to leave. So on the journey back um, to the part of Israel where he was from, they stop in a Benjamite town. And the, so it's the man, his servant, and his wife, who's referred to um, as his concubine. And from what I've looked into it, a concubine is basically a wife with less rights than a wife, but a wife nonetheless. And so they're in the town center, and nobody's taking them in. So an old man comes and says, why? You shouldn't stay here. It's late. It's dangerous. And the guy's like, yeah, no one has taken us in. I mean... We have our own provisions. It's not like we need anything, but no one has taken us in. And the old man says, tell you what, come in. Come to my house. I'll take you in. Um, you know. And then it says they, they go into the old man's house and they eat. They have a good time. You know, they, they, they have a nice evening. But then it says the wicked men of that town came knocking on the door. Bang, 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 bang. What could these wicked men want? And so he, oh, the old man goes outside. He says, Men, what do you want? And they say, yeah, you see that man that's in your house, bring him out and give him to us. Um, we would like to sleep with him. And the old man says, that's a wicked thing. You shouldn't do that. That's wicked. And I guess we would all agree. Ha hands up if you think that's a wicked thing that, they, that they're trying to do, right? Yeah, so the old man says, yeah, and you can put your hands up. We, can, we can't sing, but we can raise hands. It's safe. It's still safe, isn't it? Yeah, government guidelines allow us to raise hands. And the old man says, no, I can't do that. That's wicked, what, what you're planning to do. But then the old man says something which isn't only highly foolish, but deeply wicked. He says, yeah, don't do this wicked thing by, you know, taking this man and raping him, you guys. This is wicked. I have a better idea. Take my daughter and his concubine and have them instead. What? You go from one stupid idea to another stupid idea. But bear in mind, that was a time when everything did what was right and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And when we leave God's authority, when we do things outside of God's guidance, all kind of foolish ideas become feasible. And that's what this man is saying. Don't rape the man, but my daughter and his concubine, yeah, have them. And what you, what you find is whenever society turns from God, whenever society decides to go its own way, quite often the people with the least amount of power become the most vulnerable. And I think that what this old man suggested testifies to how little value they placed on women in that place. That you would offer your daughter instead of a man you met today. But that's what happens when everyone does what is right in their own eyes because they have abandoned God's guidance and God's kingship. Israel had no king. And so the men are adamant on having this man. So then the man, he then has an idea. What he does is he takes his wife 
and throws her outside and shuts the door. And you think, but bear in mind, everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. And without God's guidance, without God's leadership, we can do some very heinous things. And the men abuse her and they kill her. So in the morning, when the man opens his door, uh, he opens the door and he's about to leave and he finds his wife on the floor, dead. Well, well, actually no, when he opened the door, he didn't know she was dead. He found her on the floor and said to her, get up, let's go. Then realized she was dead. More madness, but that's what happens when people abandon God's guidance and God's sovereign rule. And so he takes her dead body back to his town where he came from. And then he has another great idea. He decides to cut her up into 12 pieces and send each piece to one of the tribes of Israel. And then Israel rise up and are like, how can anybody do such a wicked thing? And they speak to the man, and the man said, yes, this is what happened. I went to the Benjamite town, and they abused my wife and killed her. And so Israel are like, no, like something needs to be done about this. Someone needs to speak up. We need justice. And this is like the first time in this story where someone has had a good idea. Yeah, you need justice. Because what happened was insanity. So Israel, thousands of Israelites rise up and they go to the Benjamites and they say to them, give us the wicked men who did this thing so that we can administer justice. And the Benjamites say, no, we're not going to do that. And so they prepare themselves for war. And now the Israelites pray to God and say, which one of us should go up to fight the Benjamites? Like which tribe? And God tells them who should go first. Now, which is really interesting, because you might have times in your life where things happen, and it's, and it's clearly obvious what the right thing is to do, isn't it? So you might pray to God and ask him, okay, well, you're not even asking him if you should do this thing, because it's obvious that's what should be done. But you're asking him how you should do it. And so they don't need to say to God, God should we administer justice. That's clearly obvious. They're just saying, who is going first? And you might have times where you ask God, like, yeah, how should I do this thing? Because it's obvious what the right thing is, but how should I do it? And so God tells them who should go first. Now, just by a show of hands, if, you, if, the, if the right thing to do is clearly and painfully obvious to you, and you ask God how you should do it, and God tells you how you should do it, just by a show of hands, do you think that thing is going to be successful, just by a show of hands. Yes, if you think it's going to be successful, right? I would assume so. It's clearly obvious what I need to do. I've asked God what I should do, and he's told me what I should do. So the Bible says, after God told them to go, they go, and they get beaten, and they lose 22,000 men that day. I was like, but the right thing to do was obvious. I asked God how I should do it, and he answered me, and I face defeat. And that brings us to today's passage. Do not grow weary in doing good. Because I guess after facing that kind of defeat, the temptation would be to quit, to give up, to think, it's not worth it. Did I even hear from God? But the Israelites do not give up. They go back to God and ask him again. But this time they ask a different question. They ask, um, God, should we <laughs> go up against our brothers, the Benjamites? Oh, they're your brothers now. You remember that. Okay, cool. Should we go? So, because you might, you might have thought, maybe first time I was presumptuous. Because I didn't ask God if I should go. I just asked God how I should go. And maybe that was presumptuous. So they now ask, should we go and fight against them? And God says, yes go and fight against them. So the first time you might have thought, yes, I was being presumptuous, and so I went, but this time I have asked God if I should go, and God has told them, yes, you should go. You've asked God, should you take this action? God has said, yes, take that action. Yes, do that thing you had on your heart. Yes, do it. And they go, and then it says, 
they get defeated again. This time they lose 18,000 men. Just show of hands, how many of you would give up at this point? <laughs> I would say, Lord, not only am I giving up, but I'm going to explore Islam. Well, I'm not explore. <laughs> I, might, I might Google Islam because what is happening here? It was clearly obvious that justice was required. It was clearly obvious I was doing the right thing. I asked God how I should do it. And I suffered great loss. Fair enough. Maybe I was presumptuous. I asked God, should I do it? God said, yes. And I suffered great loss again. What is going on? But that brings us to today's passage. Do not grow weary in doing good. Because at the right time, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. And remember, I wondered, when is the right time? Who decides the right time? How do I know when the right time is? And the question of who decides the right time. So if, I, if it was me, I would have given up second time. I would have given up. But the Israelites did, did something that Galatians is telling us to do, something that we all need to do. And that's not grow weary in doing good. And that's not giving up in doing good. So they go to God again. Remember, they've lost 22,000. Then they've lost 18,000. But they go to God again. And they ask God, should we go and fight against the Benjamites? And God says, yes, go. I will give them into your hands. And it's interesting because the first two times God never said, I will give them into your hands. He just said, go. Who decides when the proper time is? God. We don't get to decide when the proper time is. But our responsibility is not to grow weary and not to give up. And so they go into battle the third time. And the Bible says, the Lord defeated the Benjamites. As believers, we are called to do good, to pursue good. But good is not achieved overnight. The results of our labor isn't achieved overnight. And, so the, and God knows that we get tired, we get weary. Some of you, like, you think about it, 2020 has been one year, kind of a year, hasn't it? Like, do you know what I'm expecting next? I'm expecting aliens. Like, that's the final plot twist, you know? <laughs> On Christmas Day, aliens have arrived. I think that was just a round of 2020 nicely because the kind of year it's been. What is happening in this year? But regardless of what the year is throwing up, we are called not to grow weary in doing good. Because if we do not give up at the right time, who decides the right time? God. At the right time, we will reap a harvest. It doesn't say we might. It says we will. Your responsibility, my responsibility, is to do good and not give up. God's responsibility is to determine when the right time is. Are you tired? of doing good? Have you been doing good for so long and thinking, what is the point? My encouragement, do not grow weary in doing good. Do not grow weary in doing what God has told you to do because at the right time, at the right time, when God decides at the right time, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. And that is a promise we can hold on to because there are some people who are pursuing things that they should give up on. And they are never going to reap a harvest. But God tells us that when we do good and we persevere in doing good, he guarantees a harvest if we don't give up. You know that your perseverance, you not giving up, will be rewarded. But it is God who decides the proper time. The verse started with a time when Israel had no king. I think God wanted them to understand, victory comes from me. You will get victory when I am your king again. Do not grow weary in doing good. Now let's just bow our heads um, as I close. And 
if you are tired, if you are weary, if, if the roller coaster of 2020 has got you on the brink, and maybe it even started before 2020, because life can be very difficult at times. If you have grown weary in doing good, and you want to say, God, I want to do good, but I'm tired and I need your help. I'm tired and I need your strength. If that is you, just lift, this, lift your hand in the air and I will pray for you. If that is you, if you're saying, God, I am tired and I need your help. I want to persevere in doing good. I don't want to give up in doing good. If that is you, just put your hand in the air and I will pray. Thank you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness. I thank you for your loving kindness, Lord. And Lord, you know our situations, Lord. You know the situations of everyone who has raised their hand, Lord. And you know their heart. Their heart is to do your will. Their heart is to, put, to continue in doing good and not to give up. And Lord, I pray that not only will you comfort them, but you will fill their heart with your peace, that you will strengthen them, Lord. For your word says, those who wait on the Lord shall be strengthened. I pray that you will strengthen them, that you will give them a burst of energy, a burst of enthusiasm, Lord, that your spirit will empower them to persevere in doing good, knowing that at the proper time they will receive a harvest. I pray your blessing, your protection over them. And Lord, I pray for the body of Christ worldwide, Lord, that as we persevere in doing your will, as we persevere in sharing the gospel, that we too will not grow weary, trusting that at the right time we will reap a harvest. So I pray, Lord, as we leave, as we go to our various places, that you, O oh God, will be with us. You will guide us, protect us, and help us to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we've come to the close of our service, but I would like to, um, I'd like to read a passage a passage from Psalms. So Psalms chapter 20. So the book of Psalms, and I'm reading from the NIV. So Psalms chapter 20. And it says... May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now this I know, the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. I'd like to read that again. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. God bless you all.